crew Who knew this white boy spit in the swine flu Now I'm just killing the rhythm Dope as penicillin When I enter the building There's a special feeling From the floor to the ceiling So hot that your skin starts peeling I feel like I'm sleeping People say wake up and stop dreaming And I ain't ever wanna open my eyes Unless I'm standing right next to the prize Morning chaps, welcome back to the vlog. Today's Tuesday and we're brewing the vacant gesture. That's what's going on over there. Behind me, we've also got a little bit of background noise today which you'll excuse. This is of course the glycol chiller which is keeping yesterday's brew the proof of concept at an optimum temperature of 18.5 degrees. In this balmy weather, it's lovely today. The sun is shining, believe it or not. We've just had a bit of cloud come over, so uh, don't let that fool you. It is definitely a hot day today. And uh, talking of cooling fermenters and hot days and all that kind of stuff, we're gonna continue with yesterday's theme, if you like, uh, where we try to fathom exactly what we're gonna do with these maxi chillers in order to keep all these fermenters behind me uh, cool throughout uh, the summer and warm throughout the winter so whilst the maxi chillers will help us keep the whole thing cold I do have another trick up my sleeve to keep them warm when we're in the chilly depths of February March and uh, indeed the yeast is just going to need a little bit of help in order to maintain that temperature to ferment, which is an odd thing to think about in weather like this. Uh, but if we're gonna start cladding these tanks, I have to make sure that the heating side is taken care of as well as the cooling side. So I'll show you what I'm gonna do, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the maxi chillers. Our brew. So this, is what we're talking about and this time of year is the best time to go out and buy them because of course it's the middle of summer and they're all reduced because they want to get rid of old stock it is indeed electric blankets that you'd use under your duvet at home in bed so the idea behind this is that we take the blanket we wrap it around the tank and then basically using this controller here we have it wired in to the STC 1000 with the controller set on full I keep the controllers on because I think there are some smart electronics in here to turn the whole thing off should there be a short so uh, we don't want to bypass that I'm not 100% sure though it would be nice if someone like Big Clive could dive into one of these and uh, show me any tips or tricks but I doubt that's going to happen because he's a busy man so what we're going to do effectively is just cut the plug off the end wire it directly into the STC 1000 of course everything on the circuit will be protected by a res residual current device I'll show you a little bit what I've done on the other tanks so this one is ideal actually to highlight how it's been connected up so it just comes out the side of the fermenting controller here and that's the cable for the heating element which obviously isn't being used at the moment and that runs down here and uh, round the back through the controller as I said and then up and it wraps around the tank and as you can see she's just set on on number three there then of course because we're wrapping a heating element around a stainless steel tank we also have an earth cable here which is anchored uh, with a very firm bolt and electrical connection so all these electrics are earthed and then of course the whole system is plugged into the wall and of course protected by an RCD and MCB across here in the fuse box so this is the MCB protecting those sockets and this is the RCD protecting the whole circuit board so now we know exactly what we're doing with the heating side of the tanks we really do need to start to address the cooling side 
So let's come across here and have a look. So what I'm hoping to do is use two or three of these maxi chillers. I was considering having one for each tank, but I frankly think that might be a little bit of overkill to be honest. And uh, I've got a big one over here, which is like a big evolution kind of maxi chiller. A little bit bigger. The glycol bath in there is actually considerably bigger than the glycol bath in these. So I think that bad boy, this fella over here, I think that's got the potential to run at least three tanks, maybe even four. And if that's the case, there we go, it's an Evo 70. So if that's the case, it's got three amps run, uh, 140 grams of refrigerant in there. Whereas if we have a look at the spec on some of the other units, let's have a look. We've got about two and something amps there. Doesn't quite tell you how much refrigerant's in it, but it's obviously going to be considerably less because it's such a smaller unit. But anyway, if we can get this to control three or more of the fermenters, then I'm only going to have to use two of the smallest units, like maybe this one, and maybe the blue one over there, to control this whole bank of five fermenters. And then that means that this three line maxi could actually come home with me and uh, I could rip out the bar and have um, a maxi chiller at home serving beer instead of the situation that I've got with corny kegs in a fridge if you like. I do like the idea of having corny kegs in a fridge though because it's keeping the beer colder and obviously extending its shelf life. Maybe I'll just revisit that whole thing and build a brand new uh, kegerator that can hold three kegs, possibly. We'll see anyway, I'm digressing. So what I want to do today, we've inspected those two chillers over there. They're good. So now I'm going to inspect this one. I think this one works. Me and Michael did test it briefly, but I'm not 100% sure. And then I think this one is kaput. So if this one is knackered, then I'll be taking this cooling fan out, which I'm hoping is 240 and we'll be replacing the cooling fan in here, which is why this unit doesn't work. Right folks, we've got one of them apart. I've got it on the floor, just doing a leak test on the, uh, what's it called? The container that the cooling coils are sat in. And I'm hoping that that is gonna be fine. Uh, but there's one thing that I just wanted to show you, which I've just discovered. So we've got these, these kind of plunger things in the chemicals to help us take measured doses of each one. They serve our 30 millilitres or thereabouts every time you push the plunger down. And the one that lives in the Cosclean, which is an alkali-based solution, sodium hydroxide, that's fine. The one that lives across here in the Persid 15, which is peraacetic acid uh, and hydrogen peroxide, that's fine. But we've had one in the AMS, which is sulf sulfuric, sulfuric acid. Now look what it's done to the stainless steel spring inside. It's like made it brittle. Have you ever seen anything like it? I mean, just look at this spring. Oh. Look at that. It's crazy. I can just crush it with no pressure whatsoever. Just breaking. The other end that hasn't been exposed, of course, solid stainless. The bottom. Well, as you can see, it's a little brittle. So yeah, does anybody know 
what that actually is that's made. I know it's the sulfuric acid, but what the chemical process is, what's missing? What's it taken away from the steel? And what's it left behind? I have no idea. Anyway, just something that fascinated me. So obviously we can't use those plunge dispensers for the sulfuric, sulfuric acid uh, for the AMS. I'm going to have to come up with something else. Maybe a plastic type spring will do the job. I don't know. Well, I'll just have to pour it, I guess. Looks like we've got success. We've harvested parts out of the non-working machine. Put it into this one, and off the back of that, we have ice forming on the coils. I'm not going to touch them because I've just done that and it actually stuck my finger to the freaking coil. So I'm not doing it again, but it's definitely freezing cold in there. This one as well, where I've harvested the pump from, the compressor and everything else does not work. But what I am able to do, I think, is remove this whole system out of, oh there we go, I'm guessing, <laughs> that's where the, uh, that's where the fault was in the line, and literally I just lifted that and it exploded, so that's let some of the gases out, unfortunately, but never mind, uh, it was already leaking to the atmosphere regardless, but yeah now, we can obviously tell that that is a dud, so what we'll do is lift this whole system out. Then I'm hoping that I can take this one, which is a slightly smaller one, and it's got a dodgy, what do you call it, reservoir tank on there. So I'm hoping I can take that reservoir tank out, take the whole system out and dump it into this one because it's got a, obviously, much bigger frame on it that's the plan and of course i'll harvest all the other pieces like the thermal switch here the capacitor the, the start capacitor anything else that i need to harvest off there i'll pull off as well here we go folks we've got this particular chiller up and running so what i've done i've hooked up the reset pump i'm gonna sneeze <laughs> I've hooked up the reset pump, which is here, to, uh, to the chiller on the back of this particular fermenter up there, as you can see. You can see the, the rigging, baby. So this is actually nice and cold, uh, but at the moment I've stopped the flow because what I want to do is uh, check for leaks. So we've had this flow stopped. There you can see the water moving again and uh, I couldn't find any leaks whatsoever in there so I'm really quite chuffed with that to be fair. So I'm just going to leave that kind of, just kind of trapped in there and recirculating for a moment just to see exactly how cold this gets. Right. There we go, and that's why we're doing this. So I have found a leak. There we are. So I'll go and get a pencil, and we'll draw around that, because obviously the pen isn't going to be much good. I'll pull you off and uh, bring you across to have a look. So there you can see just that little spot there. It's just weeping out, look. So they would have had glycol weeping out there all the time. So because this plate is actually at the top of the tank and it really wants to be down the bottom, what I'll probably do is chop this whole thing off just around the edge with the slitting disc and move it down to here. So it's the same as the other ones. So if we come across and have a look at these, uh, out of the five tanks, one, two, three of them have their cooling plates at the front and on the side. So, if I was going to do it, I may as well cut that off 
and then position that here. And then of course I can double check that uh, I've welded it correctly. And this particular tank, well if I go around the back, you'll see that this tank has got really quite a large cooling uh, plate, bigger than all of them, but again, slightly too high, but because of its dimensions, it kind of compensates for where it lacks in position. So, we know that this tank is no good because the glycol leaks. So, we're going to highlight that mark and we're going to take this plate off at another time before we clad it and we'll chop this off and move it and then that will be ready to clad because this tank has a rolled toe in angle on the top so we can put cladding timber behind here that's a good thing but two of the tanks this one and this one doesn't so i'm gonna have to take them into the shop anyway to put this rolled angle on the top so we've got somewhere for the insulation to go uh, so what I'm going to do is pull all these tanks out one by one and seeing as I'm going to have to work on them in the shop anyway I may as well uh, double check that all of the chill panels are leak free and at the same time if they do leak get them lined up ready to go into the workshop all in one hit so I'm not pulling these backwards and forwards so pretty much if we can get these angles rolled and on site in a week or two, then as soon as these arrive, we'll pull all these tanks in. If the tanks that already have the angles are okay, and they don't leak, then we'll continue to work on them, and we'll get them clad and ready to be put into circulation. So as you can see behind me, these tanks aren't gonna be such an easy fix. It's not just gonna be a simple case of putting heating jackets on there and cladding them. I've been through all of the tanks now and pretty much every one of them has got a leak on the cooling panel somewhere or another and uh, I think I'm going to have to put a little bit of effort into making sure that we are absolutely leak free. Uh, the inside's fine, the tank steel is a lot thicker than the cooling panel steel so therefore uh, they haven't actually uh, melted through the main steel tank wall so we don't have to worry about any contamination of the glycol getting into beer in the future but even if it did we do use uh, monopropylene glycol here which is food grade not the kind of stuff that you put in your car which is uh, notorious for killing cats believe it or not because it tastes sweet and they lick it up anyway I'm oh, good at this digression lock aren't I? So let me take you off the tripod and I'll show you the final test that we've got running at the moment. So the last, the last test that we have now is a leak test on this final panel. Uh, I was hoping this being the last tank I wasn't going to have a problem with it. Uh, but there is a leak here. Very difficult to see and it doesn't take much to block it up but there is a leak there. And also this section down here, I'm not 100% sure, it seems like it's got a little weep, but the weld looks a bit messy, so I'm gonna reflow that, I'm gonna reflow that, but other than that, everything else looks like it's, uh, it's kind of okay. The tank, by the way, has done its job pretty well. Uh, now we've installed a new, um, what would you call it? fan of course now we've installed a new fan you can see that the temperature is doing pretty much exactly what we want it to do so uh, once we get some glycol in there we'll be able to drop that below freezing as well not a problem so I'm just about ready to take this off the side I'm contemplating where it's going to live in order to do its job and of course we have a void here under the stairs at the side of the cold room so it's one area that we could kind of you know utilize to uh, to store maybe 
all three of those chillers. Two on the bottom and one on the top or vice versa. I don't know. It'd be nice if we could get it in there. And then also, seeing as I've been playing around with uh, chillers, I'm really contemplating extending this cold room and putting a little walk-in chiller in under here, tapped off of the main classic 100, of course, uh, which would include another radiator, another radiator fan, but simply to store hops at around four or five degrees. I'm not sure yet. I might just buy a big upright fridge like that because I'm not selling hops on the internet like I was at IVB so I don't need to hold the stock because it's holding the stock which causes the problem. It's money on the shelf and if you don't use those hops then unfortunately those hops will go off. Right, I'm going to have to put all these tanks back into position along here. While I've got them out, I might just get them up out and give it a bit of a clean and a sweep up. Um, gonna have to get all this scaffolding moved over the next day or two because if I can't find somewhere in this corner for these tank, uh, these chillers to live, then they'll just live under the stairway here. And uh, if I need to get to them, I suppose I could design it so I just lift this up and work on them, or I work on them from the other side. Either way, they should be pretty accessible under there. Well, that's it, folks. Tanks back in place, beer in the fermenter, boil kettle set to clean in the morning, as well as the HLT set to come on for tomorrow's brew, which is gonna be the best bitter. But again, it's gonna be a bit more of me fettling with these tanks, because the most important thing for me to do this week is start to get these tanks ready to be put into use. And then once I put that project to bed, uh, then maybe, just maybe, we can start looking at building a pilot kit in a few weeks' time. So, while I've got your attention, I just want to ask a couple of questions. So I'm sure a lot of you guys out there have all types of different kit from all types of different places. And uh, I toyed with the idea briefly of rolling my own pilot kit, but Frankly, for the amount of time it's going to take me to do that, I think I'd be much better off buying one. Now, I'm not looking really to buy anything branded, uh, but of course we know that New to Homebrew Thomas just brought the SS Brewtech uh, three pot system, thereabouts, and then he's made the rest up as he's gone along. So, what would your recommendations be? I've been looking at Homebrew Builder for some pots because they're reasonably priced and I'm looking to go around the uh, 70 litre boil kettle, 80 litre mash tun, 100 litre HLT area and then I'll also be building a uh, brew stand for it with a couple of uh, pump 3000s or Diablo pumps, whatever they call them, whoever's got them in stock because I don't think Matt at Kingdom does have any at the moment. So with that in mind, do you know what companies have got stuff in stock? Do you know somebody that owns a homebrew company that wants to do me a deal on a three pot system? Do you know which are the strongest pots on the market and uh, the best quality for price? I could do with just a little bit of feedback because I've been out the homebrew loop for a couple of years as you're aware. So uh, save me a bit of legwork folks and I'll concentrate on making videos for you. Anyway, that's it for today. We'll see you on tomorrow's vlog. I thank you.